prayer. This could be one of the most overlooked weapons we have as believers. I was reminded by a pivotal man of God in my life, Pastor Nate, that prayer is key to spiritual warfare. As we see our world in crisis, my question is, are we praying? Are we standing in the gap in prayer and interceding? Are we engaging in the war through prayer? Let us not sit on the power God has given to us through the form of prayer. Your prayer matters. Your prayers make a difference. The Bible says in James 5, 16, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Your prayers can make the difference. So I'm going to challenge you to make a difference through prayer. There is only one who is worthy. Come on, somebody say one is worthy. And we're going to go through the scriptures. I got a few passages, but as I was uh, thinking and praying and, um, you know, there's like when you when you're putting a sermon together, there's time where you just sit still and say, OK, God, speak to me, speak to me. And it, as as we are, I, I don't really traditionally preach a lot of sermons based on the season. But right now, if Jesus was on earth, he would be dead right now. Right. Good Friday was, what happened on Good Friday? Somebody help me out. Come on, somebody say he was crucified. Right? He was crucified. And, uh, you know, we don't talk about it, but I saw it on my cal calendar that it says Good Monday. You know, we don't talk about that too much, right? But we, if we were with Jesus right now, we would be, okay, I can't deal with it right now. We would be basically crying Sad because the Savior that we put all our hope and trust in was dead. He died on the cross. Now, he made all these promises, right? He told the disciples, and, you know, we have the book so we can kind of look at it and be like, hey, disciples, why didn't you understand what he said? But, but remember, Jesus spoke in so many parables, they might have just missed it. Oh, that's another parable. He's going to be in the belly for three days. The belly, just like Jonah, right? He said that, and then he didn't, it was like, oh, well, we didn't know what he was talking about. So during this time, if you were a follower of Jesus, you were going through emotional distress. You were worried, like, wow, this is, we thought this was him. We were expecting him to establish his kingdom. So, I mean, sometimes we have to get that because without Jesus' resurrection, we would all still be dead in our sin. We would all die and all go to hell. Right? We don't talk a lot about hell. Jesus came to set us free from the keys of sin and death, and hell was the punishment for sin and death. So we were bound. Somebody say bound. I was bound by sin until Jesus Christ came in. Oh, my goodness. That, that might have sound very easy for some people. But the, the truth is we were all bound with something. We were all corrupt. There is not one, somebody say not one, that was holy. Not one of us was worthy to carry the burden of the sins of the world. Not one of us. Somebody say only one. And as I was thinking about this, I was like, God, what passages, what passages do you want me to have in this? And he said, Luke chapter 23, we're going to go to Luke 23, and we're just going to read from 39 to 43. And Jesus was prophesied when he would die on the cross, he would die a criminal's death. Okay? It said, it, it said in the... In the, in the scriptures previously that he would be hung on a cross, right? That was the worst way to die, right? Now, just imagine, let's, let's think about this, because I don't, I don't know if any of us have actually, we, we, if we really understand what the cross death was. It was a slow death, okay? It was your lungs collapsing. Come on, somebody. You're sitting on a cross, and you, you try to keep lifting yourself up so you can take a, a breath. Everybody breathe real quick. <sighs> Easy. 
But when you're on the cross, you got to struggle for that breath, right? You got the nails that are hurting your arms, right? Nails in your arms and nails in your feet, and you're trying to just muster up some kind of strength just to get breath. It was a slow, agonizing, painful death. But Jesus did it because he was worthy. Amen? It says in Luke chapter 23, verse 39, he died a, 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 the death of a thief, but he was also hung with who? Two what? Two thieves, right? They were right next to him. And it says this, then one of the criminals, somebody say criminals. See, this is who Jesus was hung with. He was hung with the criminals. Jesus, like, I mean, sometimes when we think about Jesus, he was God, but the Bible says that he took off God so he can walk in the flesh like men. That doesn't mean he wasn't still God, though. He just humbled himself. Ah, uh, he just humbled himself. Amen. He humbled himself and said, look, I'm just going to be a man right now. I'm going to show them that we can do this. It says, then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him saying, if you are the Christ. Somebody say, if you're worthy. That's what he's saying. If you're worthy, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answered rebuking him now we don't see Jesus say anything to that man see sometimes we we wonder as Christians like when people say like as it said blasphemous stuff about God how come God doesn't just answer them well guess what he will one day he will one day but he's you know look guess what we all mess up we have all said something crazy before about God right he had to re we had to repent of it amen but he did not answer him. But the other answered, rebuked him, saying, do you not even fear God? Here's the issue right now. People don't fear God. That means they don't respect God. They don't put God on a high platform. They try to make God seem like, oh, God, if you don't, want, if you don't do it my way, God, then I don't need you. Like, God is on your level. But guess what? He's not on your level. He's not on your level. That's a lack of fear and respect for God, right? So the other criminal said, do you not even fear God? Seeing you are under the same condemnation. And we indeed justly, he's basically saying, look, I know we did it. I'm telling on myself, I messed up. I deserve this death, but he doesn't, right? Now, some people be like, how do they know? Because God was revealing himself even while he was walking to the cross. Maybe it was just the way he didn't say nothing when things were going and when he was being nailed. Maybe it was the, the, the way that he, he responded. Maybe he had just been watching from afar. But Jesus was revealing himself to this, this criminal here at this time. He says, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. Guess what? We deserve death. Okay? Get, let's, let's get this clear. None of us, including me, deserve to be saved. All right? It doesn't matter how good I am. Okay, it doesn't matter if I help old ladies cross the street. I keep cats out of trees, right? Uh, it doesn't matter if I'm, you know, it's, that's a hero's work, right? All right, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if I'm, I'm always taking care of kids, if I'm picking kids up and dropping them off, if I'm, if I'm doing all these good works, maybe I find a cure for uh, 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 cancer. Maybe I do this. Guess what? That's not good enough for salvation, Ah, uh, only one worthy. He says, but this man has done nothing wrong. How many of us can stand in here and say we've done nothing wrong? If you say yes, you have, you lied. Wrong. Right? We have all done something wrong. Then he said, Lord, in honor, in reverence, in fear, he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, see, I don't know if this criminal had studied 
Maybe the criminal has studied a little bit, right? I don't know where this criminal got this kingdom. Maybe it was just the, the banner that was above the cross on Jesus that said, this is the king of the Jews, right? But he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And guess what Jesus answered? Why? Because he honored God. He feared him, which means he respected him. And Jesus said, surely I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Somebody say today. Now, this passage in the Bible is not in Matthew, Mark, or John. I try to look it up to get different passages. They said in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or Matthew, Mark, or John, they did not really talk about this little spot here, but Luke witnessed this and said, I got to put this in here. Why? Because it probably gripped his heart. Like he's like, man, two people on the cross with him. One of them wanted Jesus, one of them didn't. One of them honored God, the other didn't. But Jesus even, I don't know if, you know, like we, we're just reading this like these guys weren't on the cross. But maybe Jesus had to lift himself back up and say, surely, right? I'm telling you, it's not easy. I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. See, if we died next to Jesus, no matter how good we are, we would have been the thieves next to him. Now, some of you are like, oh, I never stole nothing. Okay, cool. But you would have been the sinner next to him in need of mercy, in need of his grace. No matter how good we are, we aren't worthy. Matter of fact, we're going to go to Romans chapter 3 just to talk about us a little bit. Is that all right? Romans chapter 3, verse 19. Actually, I'm going to start at 18 because it, it, it's talking about man right here. And it starts and says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. I think you guys always hear me say, when somebody says something crazy about God, you almost want to take that step back and be like, whew, why? Because there's no fear. No fear of God. So they think what man thinks is we can do what we want. Because after all, I didn't get punished for just doing that. Nobody saw me. Right? Right? Guess what? God's wrath, it talks about it sometimes in the Bible when you look at it. That's not a thing we really talk about. But it says his wrath is being stored up. It's almost like he's keeping count. <laughs> right? And if you don't ask for forgiveness for what you've done wrong, that wrath is coming. Right? Right? And God's wrath is worse than any kind of wrath you can imagine. His wrath, in his wrath, listen, Sodom and Gomorrah, they were living lifestyles against God. They were talking about, talking bad, talking foul, sexually immoral, right? Doing all kinds of wickedness. And God said to Abraham, look, I got to go check out. I can't believe it's that bad, right? God said that, right? Right? Abraham was like, wait, 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 God, if there was 10. Actually, he started at 50, 50. No, 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 no. I know there ain't 50 right people in there. 40. I've been there. No, 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 God. All the way down to 10, right? And guess what? God said, nah, it wasn't 10. I only found three. It was four at first, but one of them got left behind, <laughs> right? Turned into a pillar of salt. Why? Then he came back and destroyed, the angels destroyed that city. And guess what? I, I, I saw like a, um, like sometimes the news would say, oh, we found a, a, a city that was burned and, you know, it's Sodom and Gomorrah. They found the city. And, and their ex explanation is, you know, because the world, they don't want to read the book. 
Right? Oh, it was a comet, like a huge comet just burned a crater in there. Everything was, guess what? No, that was God. God utterly destroyed them from the face of the earth. And I think there was like a curse that would happen if somebody tried to rebuild it. Right? That's Jericho too. Right? But I'm just saying like there was a thing that God did. He destroyed them because he couldn't take it no more. That was his wrath. But it says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whenever the law says, it says to those who are, whatever the law says, I'm sorry, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. All right, so what do we see here? First of all, we see that without God, we listening? Just because you do the law, maybe you keep the law, right? Maybe you haven't messed up on any of the laws, but just because you keep the law doesn't mean you will be saved. It says there would be nobody that will be justified, come on, by keeping the law. Guess what? We cannot be right in his sight by keeping the law. It says, but now the righteousness, somebody say righteousness. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. So guess what? He had to send another way for righteousness to come. Because they had the law in place. Right. And now we even hear people saying, hey, if you you have to keep the law, you have to keep the law. But the law, keeping the law will not save you. It says, but now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. So what we see here is. They had to reveal what salvation was. And it says it came from having faith in Jesus Christ, being our Lord and our Savior, right? He is the only way that we can be declared righteous because he is the one worthy. And we are not. Amen? Then it says, for all have sinned. Somebody say all. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means you. That means me. That means her, that means him, that means them over there, that means them over here. It doesn't matter. All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means we're not worthy. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. Okay, so we, the only way we can be set right is by the redemption that is in Christ. When something is redeemed, anybody ever redeemed a coupon? You had a coupon, you went to this store, it said this, they gave you something for it, right? That's what Jesus did. He redeemed us, and if we accept his redemption, we now have righteousness. It's not us going back to the law, right? We don't go back to the law and say, okay, now let me just... Stay in this square here. Oh, don't, don't, don't do that. Let me, I can't move here. No, no that's not what it's saying. It's saying accept the re redemption from Christ because that's the only way that we will not be still seen as sinners in his sight. Verse 25 says, whom God set forth as the propitiation by his blood. Propitiation is a, is a real big word that I have never heard none of you guys say. Right? But it means payment. Okay? Set forth as a payment by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that, that he might be just and the justifier of one who has faith in Jesus. So what is it saying? Jesus was the payment, the one-time payment that will cover your sins, even the ones you committed before he died and the ones after he died, right? He is the true payment that is 
covering us who accept him. See, Jesus died for all, but the problem is all won't accept that. Have you ever met somebody that would not admit they needed help? And you can see they need help? Right? That's called pride. Pride kills many people and it keeps them from accepting what they need, right? Pride keeps us, many people, from accepting Jesus Christ. You guys listening? Pride will keep many people bound in their sin because they are unwilling to ask for help. Somebody say, I ask for help. I will ask. I remember I had a meeting with a brother that was telling me, like, you know, with my music, he was like, hey, man, you, you, you should not be prideful and not ask people for help. And, you know, at first I was like, but I, I don't, you know, I just don't want to be that guy that's, like, asking people you know, like, like we all kind of justify it, and, and he was like, you, you, that's pride. And I was like, oh, okay, well, look, hey, if you guys want to help me, help me. <laughs> right, right, I won't block you from helping, right? But what we, what we didn't see is something, even in that aspect, sometimes we're so prideful, we act like we got everything under control. But God, somebody say God, he's willing to help us as long as we ask him. Amen. Let's go to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 to 11. We are unworthy, y'all. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Listen to that. When we were without strength, what were we without strength in? We were without strength in sin defeating us. Right? We were losing. I was losing. But Christ still died for the ungodly. See, some people, sometimes at church, we make it seem like Christ died for Christians. Nah. You know that person that you walk down the street from, by, and you want to get on the other side of the street? Christ died for them. Right? Oh, okay, maybe, maybe uh, uh, it's that lady that's out on the street late night, and, and she barely got anything on, and you know what she's doing. Christ died for her, right? Or maybe it's the business, the guy at Wall Street that looks all nice and he's really a crook. Christ died for him. God did not die. He, he even said it out his own mouth. I did not come to bring righteous, the righteous to me, but I came to draw sinners to me, right? I did not, I, I, he basically said, I came as a doctor, Right? Not for the people that are healthy, but for those that are sick. Now, the church is a place not just for those that are healthy, but those are, that are sick. Now, sometimes we want to make church like country clubs where only these people can come in. Oh, yeah, he's good. Okay. Ah, hold up. <laughs> you don't meet the criteria. Right? And guess what? That's not God. That's your criteria. Sometimes God got to change our whole mindset. That same person that just, just got done shooting people, guess what? God can save him. That's how powerful he is. Not only can God save them, he can radically turn their lives around. Right? Paul was the kind of same kind of person that was working on killing people, but God turned his life around. Right? God can do that because it says, while we were still without strength, against sin, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely, the Bible says, for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare die. But God demonstrated his love towards us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Have you ever did something for somebody that didn't respect what you did? 
and it doesn't feel good. Right? It does not feel good. They rejected him. But see, God did, died, he did die for us when we were on the wrong side. The Bible even calls us in, in Ephesians, it says we were at enmity with God, meaning we were enemies. Now, if I called you an enemy of God, you would be offended. But we were, I was an enemy of God. Now, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have a bad, I didn't do too much bad. But guess what? A little bad is too much. <laughs> right? I, I didn't get in a lot of trouble growing up. I, when I, my last whooping was probably 12 years old, right? I didn't get a lot of whoopings, and I didn't want to, I, I always had a heart, I did not want to make God upset. Why? Because I want to be in right standing with God. Not because I want all these blessings, you know, I just want all these blessings. No, I want the blessing of being in the right standing with God. Right? That, that speaks volumes to me. But I still, when I, if I did not accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I still was his enemy. See, look, this is the thing we got to catch. Sometimes we, we talk so much about the Antichrist. The Antichrist is coming. No, the Antichrist is really somebody that doesn't accept God. And the Bible has said that that spirit has been in the world for years. Even while he was here, right? The spirit that says, no, I don't need you. Let me do this on my own. That's just the little part of it. And then it gets worse. Let me find my own way to God. Let me find my own way through pleasure, through all these other things. But it says God demonstrated his love towards us even while we rejected him. He died for us. Verse 9 says, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath. Remember I was talking about his wrath? We are saved from his wrath when we accept him. Amen? We shall be saved from the wrath through him because we have been justified in him by his blood. Verse 10 says, for if we were enemies... We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Reconciliation is, is another big word that people don't really talk to. I mean, it's kind of more like we, we hear people say it sometimes, right? Being reconciled means to be put back together, right? We are placed back together in our relationship with him because of Jesus Christ. Now, as I said when we started, this is when Jesus was dead. All of this comes up, um, comes into our life because of his death, right? Even though back then they were mourning, if Jesus didn't die, we would still be bound, right? There was only one worthy, only one worthy. We would still be bound. We would still be enemies of God. We would still be, like I said, bound, <laughs> Stuck. But God sent his son to die for us while we were sinners to reconcile us, to bring us back to him. Amen. And one day, all of us are going to have to bow and rec recognize that he is truly the only one that is worthy. The Bible says that every Knee will bow, and every tongue will confess. Well, I'm sorry, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Well, they will fess up too. Like, <laughs> I messed up, or I need you, right? But every tongue will confess. What does that look like? You better say that now before His wrath hits. 
Because when his wrath hits, it'll be too late. Right? Now, my kids, they watch Superbook sometimes, and a uh, little cell, he's always watching the one with the devil in it, right? And I'm like, dude, can you stop watching that one? Watch another one. He, he likes the sword fighting, though. In this one, Lucifer, he fights against uh, the archangel Michael, and Michael banishes him um, and beats him, basically, right? But at the, on a very, one of the very last ones of Superbook, even the devil had to bow down. So they see him getting, getting slammed down to his knees, and he says, Jesus Christ is Lord. Right? Every knee. Somebody say every knee. Every knee will have to bow. Every kid, every adult, every knee is going to recognize that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is the only one worthy. There's a scripture in the Bible. I was looking it up. I didn't write it down, but in Revelations, it talks about who is worthy to open these scrolls. We have no one. And the Bible says that in heaven, it was silent because they thought nobody could open it. But then the angel told, oh, who's the guy that wrote that book? Um, dang it. I can't remember his name right now. But the angel told the writer of the Revelations that, wait a minute. Yeah, that's right, John. He told him that it was, there is one. Wait a minute, there is one. And he's like a lamb that was slain, right? And he is able to open the scrolls and he is able to deliver. <coughs> and because of that, all heaven rejoiced. They broke out in song and said, holy is the lamb, worthy is the lamb who takes away the sins of the world, worthy. And the Bible says, if you keep reading in Revelations, they continue to say that, worthy is the lamb, worthy is the lamb, right? Why? Because he is truly worthy. And during this season, let us not forget that it's because of his death that we are drawn to him. It's because of his death he showed his love towards us. Some of us wouldn't die for our friends and family, but it said he died for us while we were sinners. So let us rejoice in his death, but not leave it there because he didn't just die. He rose up. Amen. But sometimes we have to remember what his death represented. Amen. Amen. 